Well, it's good to be back uh, with everyone. I feel like we've been, uh, Sanford family's been just out for, feels a couple of years just because of how much sickness has gone through our household. We've got six kids at home, and so whenever we have sickness come on through, it tends to come in waves, and it takes just forever for things to, to work all the way through. And I don't know why it works this way in my household. I don't know, parents, this has been the same for you, but all of my kids tend to get sick disproportionately when I'm sleeping. That tends to be when it works out. So even when I feel okay, they make sure that I don't feel okay for that long when they're the ones who are getting sick. But I've been able to commandeer some of the time we've had for these past few weeks. I'll hold up together in the home read through about five more commentaries on Daniel and have learned that there are five more views of Daniel that I didn't know about until these last couple of weeks. And so even though since we've been moving through Daniel quite slowly, especially Daniel 9, uh, last time we were here, I was in Daniel 9, verse 24. That's all we did was verse 24. Uh, Laura asked me as I left the house this morning, she said, so you're going to wrap up Daniel chapter 9 today? And I said, no, I'm actually probably going to have to redo verse 24. So we're going to go back, we're going to do a little bit of 24, and then into 25, and that's probably about as far as I plan to get today. Now the reason for this is not just because uh, I love this particular passage, but because there is so much that's going on here. The text The Hebrew writing that undergirds what we're reading here is extraordinarily difficult. And there's a whole bunch of historical and textual reasons uh, that that's the case. And so we're going to have to mine out some things here. But it's not just one of those texts that's, ah, that's an interesting poetic phrase there. We're not sure what that means. These things have significant meaning. And as I've said in the past when we've walked through this passage, this will definitely be very informative as to how you view much of the Old Testament, and it could be very informative as to how you view much of the New Testament. How you view Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, could dramatically impact the way you view the second coming of Jesus Christ, what we have to look forward to in our future, and so it really is an important passage. So we're going to have to spend a little bit of time working our way through it, and I hope to serve you well in doing that. So we're going to start in verse 24 today. If you have your Bibles with you, I think it'll be helpful to follow along. Go to Daniel 9. We'll be in uh, verse 24 and 25. I'm just going to read through this section. I'm going to read through verses 24 through 27. I'll pray and then go back through uh, and cover 24 and 25. So follow along, if you will, 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks." Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Let's pray. Father, this passage has been written according to your Holy Spirit uh, by Daniel, an Old Testament prophet. And this text has been preserved all the way up till now for our benefit, that we would read it that we would learn to understand it as much as we can, that we would seek to understand it as much as we can. And so, Lord, I pray for insight. I pray for wisdom and for help as we seek to do that. Father, as a preacher, I pray that you would help uh, protect me from importing any of my views into this text. It's so challenging to not do that. Please, uh, please help us to see what is here, Lord, what was intended in your writing, uh, what it meant to the audience that first received it, Daniel and his contemporaries and 
how we can view it today, Father. We just want to be faithful Bible readers. We don't, want to, we don't want to be writers of Scripture. We want to be readers of Scripture. So, Father, please help us to be that this morning and, uh, and learn to love your Word more and more based on the way that we study this today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we're going to back up to verse 24 and set the stage for today. But you need to know that Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most significant passages in the entirety of the Bible that deals with the end times. That's the theological category of eschatology, the study of last things. So if you're all interested in end time stuff, then you know about Daniel chapter 9. If you're not personally very interested in end time stuff, you've never done a big study through that kind of thing, you need to know Daniel 9 is one of the most well-known passages in the Bible that refer to end times. Almost certainly the most eschatological passage of the Old Testament that people draw upon to talk about end times today. All the Old Testament, this might be the key to all of its eschatology. And so that's why it's worthy to spend the time here. Daniel is an exile. He's an Israelite who had been, uh, during the conquering of ba- uh, Jerusalem by Babylon, had been taken into the Babylonian court, been raised there. He'd been serving in that court for decades At the end of his time of serving there, he cries out to God and asks for God to restore the people back to the broken and ruined city. Rebuild the city, Lord. Do the things that you'd promised that you were going to do. And he cries out to God to do this. And God's answer to his prayer is to send the angel Gabriel to come to Daniel and give him a vision. And more than a typical vision, this one is just simply an angel speaking words to Daniel that he records in chapter 9. And what Gabriel says here, we're reading in 24 through 27. I'm going to pick up in 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint a most holy place. Let me point out two things you're going to need to know about this verse in order to understand the rest of the vision. I have covered these the last time that we were here in verse 24, but rather than go through the whole thing again, I'm just going to give you the two summary points you need to have in mind to understand the next verse we're about to cover. First, this verse introduces the 70-week time frame. See that there? 70 weeks. That 70 weeks is officially, and the language is actually 77, that's 70 units of seven time frames. Almost everyone who reads this and regards this vision sees this as 490 years. There's a handful of textual reasons. This is not the way 70 weeks, the wording there is not the way that they would have written weeks, meaning days, 24-hour periods of time. In fact, that use is in chapter 10, the first few verses there, because Daniel's resetting the clock to make sure we know he's talking about actual days and weeks, not years. So this is almost certainly 77s or 70 groups of seven years, which totals 490 years. And again, on this, almost every scholar agrees. Now, you can either view that 490 years as symbolic or as literal. To be sure, we should all see these as symbolic numbers, but the question is whether it's only symbolic or if it's only, or if it's supposed to be taken very literally. Now, just to show you uh, my cards here, I typically lean towards the symbolic view of these types of passages because those kinds of numbers and the use, especially in prophetic visions like this, are always very, very symbolic. So that's usually my starting point. However, I must admit that the way the numbers seem to work out in this situation make me more inclined to see this as a precise 490 calendar years. I'm not dogmatic about that. I could be convinced otherwise, I admit, but it does seem like that's what's going on here, and we'll get to why uh, shortly. But 490 years is what's in mind. I think that means a literal 490 calendar years. 
So that's the first thing, 70 weeks. There's a time frame in mind. And what's that time frame covering? This list of six things regarding the Jewish people. God's work with the Jewish people will last 490 more years. That's what he's saying. And what I just said there is agreed upon by almost all scholars. There's a few qualifiers to that we'll get into as we move forward. God's work with the Jews, 490 years. And these six things in that list are to be accomplished within that frame of time. So the first thing I wanted to point out to you is the 70 weeks. You need to know that's the 490 years of God's work with the Jews. The second thing you need to know is that these six things listed are what are going to be accomplished by the end of the 490 years. The last time we were in this text, I spent significant time walking through each of those six things. It took an entire sermon to go ahead and do that. Now, how you view those six things will largely determine, uh, will almost certainly determine how to view the rest of this vision. And it might determine how you view eschatology, the end times all in the rest of the Bible. So it's really significant to understand what's going on in verse 24. Let me summarize the the, the big picture issue that you got to deal with right here. Are those six things accomplished by our day? Have those already been finished? Or are we waiting for them to be finished in the future? That's the big question. If you look at that list to finish the transgression to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, to anoint a most holy place. If you look at that list and think that's been accomplished in Jesus, then you're going to view the rest of this passage as past, in the preterist sense. That's the way you're going to interpret this. You're going to be looking at the next few verses and going, oh yeah, that happened when Jesus came. But if you read this list and you think, oh no, that's future, that's going to come down the line, that hasn't happened yet, certainly that's to come after our day, then as you read the rest of this, you're going to be motivated and you're going to kind of have to find in here a way to make that 490 years extend for thousands more years than it was listed here. That's a futurist reading of the text. Preterist reading of this text is to say, all of this is done. Futurist reading of the text is, no, it's still future. And as I said before, I'll say it again, where I land with this particular passage, I think that all of this has already been accomplished in Christ. I spent an entire sermon walking through all the language and the details as to why I think that's the case. There's plenty still to be had in the future. I still, personally, and my my end times view is that I I still believe there is an antichrist figure in the future, in the end times, that's going to have to be dealt with. Jesus' personal coming and return will finally rescue those who are his and punish those who aren't. All of that is to come in the future, but I don't think that's what this text is talking about. I think this text is all things that have been satisfied in the first coming of Jesus. And so... The way that I'm going to be preaching through the rest of the Daniel 9 vision is with that in mind. I want you to know that's where we're going to be going with this. I I will draw on the other views to show you some comparisons when uh, we get to helpful points like that. But that's the view that I see this in, and that's the interpretive lens through which I'll be preaching. Moving to verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. There is a lot to break down in this verse. It may seem like the statements are kind of simple. The language especially makes this extraordinarily challenging, and so we're going to spend uh, the rest of our time today picking this apart and then applying it today. The angel Gabriel, in speaking this right here, is about to break down that 490-year period into three groups. He's about to break it down into three groups. But before we get to that, he establishes the start date for the entirety of that 490 years. And the start date is when? 
from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. From the going out of the word. That's the start point for this 490-year countdown. Whether it is literal or symbolic, there is a start point. And it's when the word goes out. Now, there are a few possibilities on the starting point, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear. And each of them are biblical. Each one you can find in the Bible statements that make it, you go, ah, that, that might be the point in biblical history when that 490 began. I'm going to give you the three most common ones just for, for, your, uh, for, for your benefit here. The first uh, possible starting point is Cyrus's command to go rebuild the temple. Cyrus is the ruling Persian king who's in, in charge as Daniel is getting this vision from Gabriel. Cyrus is the ruler. Uh, Daniel gets this vision. Cyrus, almost immediately after this point, will make a declaration, and he will say, go, Daniel, go, Jews, back to your land. I will even fund the rebuilding of your temple, and he will issue a decree to rebuild that temple. And so some would go, well, that's when it is. And, and just for the reference point for that, that's 537 B.C. 537 B.C. is right when that would have taken place. That's when the 490-year countdown could have begun. Now, I don't know if you heard it there, but there was something technically missing in that decree that I just stated. Cyrus only says, go rebuild the temple. But if you look at uh, what is said in verse 25, you can go to verse 25 there for, for everybody to take a look at. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. See how it doesn't mention the temple? So there's a big debate. Well, is this just Gabriel's way of meaning the temple and the city? Or is this an actual different statement, a different decree than the build the temple decree. Does that, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? So is this satisfy, is, does Cyrus' decree to rebuild the temple satisfy this line? Because he didn't tell them to build Jerusalem. He just told them to build the temple. And so there are more options. 537 is the first one, Cyrus' command to build the temple. The second option would be from a later Persian king, Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes issues a decree in the days of Ezra. Ezra, who is told about earlier in, in the Bible here. Ezra, who sent back to, to go shepherd the people, to be a priest to the people, and to, and to continue the rebuilding process of the temple and the landscape and even the city of Jerusalem. And Artaxerxes tells Ezra to go back and even funds the entire journey. He, he, he gives money. He gives enough money to finish anything that needs to be accomplished for the temple that had not yet been accomplished since Cyrus's decree, and he also gives him extra money and says, do whatever you want with the rest of the extra money that your people need in that city. And so, perhaps that satisfies the rebuilding of the temple and the city, because the decree went out for him to send more people, to send all the stuff back, additional money to rebuild whatever they need, perhaps the city. That would have been 457 B.C., but there's a third option, because technically that decree didn't mention, at least in the passage we have in Ezra 7, didn't specify the city of Jerusalem, it just kind of implied the city of Jerusalem. Finally, Artaxerxes will give a second decree to Nehemiah, the biblical character of Nehemiah, to go and he will finally say, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. <laughs> That's what will finally just make it very clear. And so that takes place in 445 BC. And so you'll see that there are at least those three well-attested, well-counted dates that the 490 years could have begun. Now, that is a little bit challenging to figure out. If you, if you look at, a, if you're thinking 490 could either be literal or symbolic, that's already one big point of deviation. Additionally, there are different ways to count the years. Some have noted that the Babylonian and thus then the Persian calendar counted 364 or 365 days of the year, while some argue that the Jewish prophetic calendar only counted 360 days of a year. 
And so over decades, that would be a pretty dramatic difference in time. There are ways to count lunar years versus solar years. Uh, there are ways to even starting the starting point of years. Usually they say something like, during the first year of so-and-so's reign. But that could be almost anywhere in a calendar year. That could be the first day of his reign or the last day of that first year. You kind of get so the, the span could overlap. There's a whole bunch of difficulties in how to count the dates. And so it's very challenging to be precise. And so I think that at the very least, this should remind us to be really charitable with the differing viewpoints on how exactly to count this. If you have more questions about that, I have many pages more of study that I've walked through on this. I'd be happy to answer more of the detailed questions. But let me summarize this for you right now. As I've studied through this, I think that it is most likely that that second option of the starting date is the correct one. Artaxerxes' decree to Ezra. Because that's the one that at the very least implies that the rebuilding of Jerusalem takes place. It's not the temple. That's already mostly been accomplished. That was very clearly done already. And that would have been in 457 B.C., 457 B.C. I don't feel super rigid on this. A different start date would not dramatically change my views here, but nonetheless, it does seem like that's the best candidate to me, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But I think 457, Artaxerxes' decree in Ezra, I think that that's the one that's in mind here in Daniel's vision. So we have a starting point. But what marks the end of this period of time? We'll continue reading the verse with me. From the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. So I'm arguing that's 457. From 457 BC to the coming of an anointed one, a prince. The coming of an anointed one, a prince. So we have the start and the end events for this date. What's the starting event? The starting event is the going out of the word. What's the ending event of that period? The coming of an anointed one, a prince. This, to be sure, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the prince. No other character in all of human history can adequately fit this description. You know what word is used for anointed one right here? It's just the Hebrew word for anointed one, Mashiach. That's where we get the word Messiah. Literally speaking, this says the coming of the Messiah, a prince. That word for prince is also really special. If you were to study that word, it's, it's, it's kind of unique. You, you might be thinking, well, that's kind of interesting. It wasn't a king. Like, isn't he the king of kings? Isn't, isn't like that? That's the kind of ruler in mind. Well, the word for prince here has two connotations that are especially uh, perfect for Jesus Christ. First, he's the son of the high king. That's the first thing. So we're looking for a Messiah, son of the high king. That's what we're looking for. Second, if you were to look at the word for king that could have been used here instead, melek, that Hebrew word, and you were to chase through all the Hebrew use of it in the Old Testament, everywhere you saw king in the Old Testament, and then this word, nagrid, which is prince here, that's ruler, uh, commander, leader, it's also referred to that way in, in English as we translate it, but that word, nagrid, and if you were to hunt that one down everywhere in the Old Testament, do you know what you'd find? This is awesome to me that this is used here. Gabriel knew what he was saying. Because when melech is used, king, that word is used, it is oftentimes used in the context of a king who is battling with God over who's in control over his territory. That's usually the way that word is used when it's being used in context in the Old Testament. But this word for prince, not grid, this word is actually the word that is used when a ruler sees himself as an extension of what God is commanding to do and honoring what the Lord says to keep things running. In fact, when King David anoints his son Solomon, he anoints Solomon as the prince, the anointed one of Israel. This exact same word. Because Solomon knew he needed wisdom from God to rule according to his statutes. That was the context of that passage there. And how perfectly does that fit our Savior? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, the Son of the Most High God, who rules and sees all of his rule as under 
the perfect guidance and authority of our high king. So we are looking for a ruling Messiah, a son of the king. While it is true that there have been a few different options named for this anointed one. There are some people who disagree. Ah, that's not Jesus. That's somebody else. Do you know who the majority of opinions those come from? The Jews. Modern Jewish scholars are the ones that go, no, 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 no. That's not what it's saying there. Why? Because they're highly motivated to make this not be Jesus because they've already predetermined to reject him as their Messiah and they're trying to find anybody else to fit the billet for an anointed one, a prince. And so they'll usually say it's one of the high priests during the intertestamental period, during the period after Daniel before Jesus. It must be one of those high priests. That's that's the anointed one, the Messiah one there. You and I know, of course, that is not what's going on. And how long is that period of time? Start date is what? Going out of the word. End event is what? Coming of the anointed one. What's the duration? Well, that's what it says next. From the going out of the word, oh, you can, you can go back to that slide, that's okay. From the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, period, then for 62 weeks, and a pause. We have a problem here. Now, this, this took me days to unravel this whole thing because I, one of the things that I do and I'm, I'm pounding through text like this and I'm looking at the original language stuff as much as I can and using all the resources available, one of the things that I'll do is I'll check other English translations uh, to see how other groups of translators have, have uh, translated the language of Hebrew into English. And what I found is after reviewing dozens of English texts, the ESV is the only one that I found that has a period with the word then following it. This is the only one I could find. All the rest of them look like this. Go ahead and go to the next slide now. I'm going to just, it's the NASB. It's another English translation. Look at this with me. You'll, You'll hear how it's very similar at the beginning, but notice the difference. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, that's the going out of the word, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until, and look, even here they use the word Messiah, Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. You see that? That's how almost every other translation of the Bible has it. Seven and 62, which equals what? 69. Seven weeks, 62 weeks, that's a 69-week period. All of them show up this way. Man, it took me forever to uncover. Why in the world did the ESV have it that way? I'll give you the very quick summary now. If you want to rip apart the answer, answer deeper, come ask me about this later. Long story short, the ESV relied upon the Jewish Masoretic texts more heavily. And in the 10th century AD, um, almost a thousand years after Jesus Christ, Jewish scholars were highly motivated to erase Jesus from the Old Testament as much as possible. And so when they were correcting and making changes into the Masoretic text, they were able to break this verse into two separate lines. They didn't technically change the words at all, but they technically broke the sentence in half and put half half of it on its own line, which made it appear as though it's its own sentence. They didn't use punctuation, so it didn't didn't quite play out the way that our English language would right now, but that's what they did. And so the ESV is relying upon the Jewish translation to get there, while all these other English translations are relying relying mostly on the, uh, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament translation, which was actually mostly under control of Christians and not being messed with by Jews trying to erase Jesus. So then it started making sense what's going on. So 7 and 62, totaling 69 weeks. Do the math in your head. 69 weeks is 483 years. So what's being said? From the going out of the word, the issuing of a decree, up until Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, there shall be 483 years. Now, real quick, because somebody might be thinking this, why the breakdown? Why the 7 and 62? Why not just say 69? Well, almost certainly because the seven sevens, the first seven sevens, refers to the actual period of time in which the city was being rebuilt. 
And the rest of it, it was built already and that was just standing. That's probably what's going on there. So a total of 69 weeks that's taking place between the going out of the word and Jesus Christ coming. And what should we see about this city? The construction of the city? Squares and moat. Here it says plaza and moat. It'll be built again, even in times of trouble, troubled times, times of distress. Squares and moat, uh, squ- uh, plaza and moat. All that is, that's just the parts of a city. Square, like a public square. That's streets and plazas. It's kind of where they intersect. Uh, it's people would have done a lot of business in there. Trench, moat. You and I might think of moat as kind of around a medieval castle filled with water and alligators and sharks and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, oftentimes in the Middle East, they didn't fill them with water. They just left them nice and empty, but it made the exterior wall a longer drop and far- farther for enemies to come on up. That's just features of a protected city, completed and finished. That's what they had in Jerusalem, and that's what's being prophesied. Remember, Daniel is living during a day when the entirety of the city is in ruins, And what's he asking for? Lord, restore the city and the people and your temple. And this line right here, listen, all of the city will be rebuilt. It's it's going to be done. Streets, trench, wall, moat, all of that. All of the city is going to be completed. But it even qualifies that time period. But in a troubled time, in times of distress, it says in the NASB there. And that's exactly what characterized this time of history for the Jews. Upcoming chapters in Daniel will even cover that period of history more. We're going to actually see that in chapters 10 through 12, that that period of history that takes place prior to the coming of Jesus, that was a tumultuous time. That was a distressing, troubling time. In fact, by the time that Jesus comes onto the scene, when Jesus arrives into history, is everybody going, man, life is great, no problems here, we got this thing down? No, no. The point is he arrives into history when Jerusalem is in dire need of a savior, when everything around them seems as though it's crumbling and falling apart. That's exactly what is experienced there. I want you to remember with me the starting date that I said before, I think it's 457 BC, Artaxerxes' decree. That's the going out of the word. His word went out to restore the rest of the temple and the city, 457 BC. If you move forward in history, 483 years, 69 weeks, 483 years, do you know where that brings you to? The day of Jesus' baptism. The day that the Messiah was anointed for ministry. The beginning of Jesus' ministry time. In fact, do you remember what Jesus did when he was 19 years old? No one does because it's not even recorded because it doesn't tell us. He was just growing in wisdom and stature because his ministry kicks off at his baptism. That's where everything begins for Jesus. All of his mighty work starts. That's the anointing of Jesus for his work, his public anointing. And just for the record, we're going to get into this in upcoming weeks, uh, but How long did Jesus' ministry last while he was on on earth before he uh, was crucified? Three and a half years. Half a week. We'll get there. But half a week, which is what we're going to see in the upcoming text as well. So you you see why, even though I typically see lots of just symbolism in these numbers, how it's hard to mistake how, how much it lines up with all the dates. And again, I could be wrong on the dates on some of this stuff. Maybe it really is more symbolic than I think, and maybe the, the, the way we're doing the numbers is not exactly correct. But I'm inclined to think that it is supposed to be literal for that reason. That's why it seems like 457, all the way up into the day of Jesus' baptism, makes sense to us there. The next two verses, 26 and 27, will tell us what happened after the first 69 of Daniel's 70 weeks. But already up until this point in uh, Gabriel's statement to Daniel, we can call it a vision, they do call it a vision, but he's not really seeing anything, he's just hearing these words from Gabriel. Up until this point, we've already covered 99% of the time. Not literally, 99% of the time has been covered. 69 of 70 weeks has already been talked about. What's coming up next is all that's gonna come after the 69th week. And that's where we're going to be 
next week. As we come back here and I, I preach through this again, we're going to touch back on this because there's a bunch that still has to be drawn upon, but that's what's coming. But before we kind of conclude and rush past this, I need you to, to see this. I want you to back up and remember with me what prompted this vision to be given in the first place. Daniel was praying for the people to be restored to the city, for the city and the temple to be rebuilt. That's what's going on. He cries out, forgive me, Father, forgive my sins, forgive the sins of my people, bring us back to your city on the basis of your mercy, your forgiveness, not because we're so worthy. And what happens? The Lord answers, Gabriel. Now, why is it that Daniel prayed then for that to happen? Do you remember? It's been a couple of months now since we were at the beginning of chapter 9. But at the beginning of chapter 9, it said so because Daniel counted the numbers and knew that the 70 years was coming to a close. 70 years. Years was coming to close. So go to, the, go to the next slide. Let's put this up here. The, the 70 years is how long the people were to be in exile. That's how long the Jewish people, the Israelites, were to be removed out of the land. They got kicked out. God had promised them for decades, for centuries, if you continue to dishonor me, I will kick you out of the land. That is the old covenant. That is the Mosaic covenant. You break my laws. You don't atone for those sins in the way that I've told you to. I will remove you out of the land. That was the old covenant. And he followed through because the people failed. And he told them that they were to be in exile for 70 years. Do you remember why? Why the number 70? It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't as though, it sounds good, 70 is a good long number. No, it was a very specific number for a specific reason. In fact, if you think about it, the, the Jews at the beginning uh, of their days coming out of Egypt, they were, in, they were in exile in wandering for 40 years. But here he picks 70. Why? Second Chronicles 36.21 told us why. I have covered this. I'll do it quickly right now again. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. That's what the text says. So 70 years was not arbitrary. 70 years was because God said, you owe me 70 years worth of Sabbath rests for the land itself. You see, way back in the days of Moses, hundreds of years before this time, God had given his law to his people, and he commanded that his people would work the land for six years, and on the seventh, they would abstain. They would not work the land to let it rest. That was the point. God even said that he would supernaturally provide for them on every sixth year so that they'd have so much abundance that it would last for three years. That's literally what he said. Not just one, not just two. I'll literally make it last for three years. You'll be, in, you'll be two years into the second cycle before you run out of the food that I blessed you with in that, one, that sixth year, if you trust me. So they were supposed to work six, let the land rest for the seventh, but they wouldn't do it. They violated God's command that God required of them. And he, he added up the numbers and told them, you, he didn't say, listen, that, that rule was, dumb or, was already dumb, so let's just not worry about it. He said, no, I'm getting those years. 70 years. 70 years for every seven they missed. What's the math on that? Next slide. 490 years. That's how long they had refused to obey the Sabbaths. That's how long they didn't give the Sabbath rest. And it actually goes back all the way to the days of Saul, the first king of Israel. That's that 490 years. All, this is what it is. It's all of the time that the Israelites had control of the land of Israel. It's the entire duration of the kingdom of Israel. They were a people before then. They were people who were fighting and battling over the territories and finally they have control. And God gave them a king in Saul, and then to David and Solomon, and then this split into a divided kingdom, and Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and down all the way until it made it to the destruction of the northern and southern kingdoms. That period of time was 490 years. 
And all throughout that time, all throughout the time that they had a king, they never let the land rest. And so God required 70 years for them to make it rest. Isn't that incredible? It's almost precisely how long Israel had been a kingdom. And how long is Daniel being told that God will be working again with the Jewish people? Next slide, just as he's already said. 490 more years. Do you, do you see that? Listen, this isn't just like I came up with some weird numbers. That's like literally what the texts are saying. It's hard to not see the symbolism that's going on here. You know, as modern Westerners, we sometimes kind of push back on that stuff because whether you lean towards the literal counting of the dates or symbolic counting of these dates, we oftentimes underemphasize the rich symbolism in these numbers. There's meaning here. Jesus was buried in the ground for three days, not because they're like, ah, one, two, three, sounds good. There's, there's significance to those numbers. When God speaks to his people and gives them numbers, it matters. There's nothing arbitrary in God's work with us here. And so this actually does have meaning. You might know that numbers were a very significant part of the Hebrew language and of their culture. Numbers especially like the number three, seven, ten, Twelve, and all the multiples of those are very significant to the people of Israel. Why? Because those are numbers that God gave them for significance, not that they came up with on their own. Every seven years, they were to have a Sabbath rest, just like every seven days, they were to take one Sabbath rest. But did you know also that every group of seven sevens Every seven years, one Sabbath rest, seven of those groups, they were to have an even bigger rest. Do you know what that was called? Who knows what it's called? Just say it if you know what it was. The Jubilee. This was every 49 years. There was supposed to be an extra special, seven times more special celebration, the Jubilee. It was the year of the Lord's favor. It was a special rest on the land. It was to be a Sabbath rest like all the other Sabbath year rests should have been, but this one was extra significant because it was literally supposed to be the time in which prisoners would be set free, when those who had been indentured servants and slaves to others were to be set free, where land was to be returned back to the owner owning family, originating tribal family, so that all go back to where it started. It's amazing. Did you know that when, in the Old Testament, Jews purchased land, it was designed that they should have calculated how much time was left before the next jubilee? Because their purchase would just be a land lease. If they're like, well, we're 40 years left. Okay, I have 40 years of this land. Okay, it's going to cost me a lot more because I'm going to have it for 40 years to work for me and I'll get all the fruits of the labor off of that land. But if they're like, well, next year's Jubilee, well, I'll get it on a deal. And that's how it was supposed to work because they'd only own it for one year. It's incredible how God had built this in. Every 49 years was the year of Jubilee. So 490 years, how many Jubilees is that? 10. That's 10 of those. You see, these numbers are really significant to the people. You've already seen that the angel tells Daniel of 70 sevens. That's 10 jubilees. And as we've been saying, when would Jesus finally come? At the final jubilee. At the jubilee of jubilees. At the 10th, the, the completion of the jubilees. The ultimate one. In fact, the ultimate jubilee that was prophesied about and foretold in Isaiah 61. I want to read for you just part of Isaiah 61, which was to be the year of the Lord's favor. This was to be the ultimate jubilee. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, pop quiz. What was the very first text that Jesus read out loud right after he got baptized and his ministry began? That one. That text. The ultimate jubilee text. Jesus was telling the people after he read it, and he closed that scroll, and he set it back down. And he, what did he say to them? This has been fulfilled in your hearing. Why? Because he came 490 years 
the end, the conclusion. He was there at the final week, that Sabbath, that ultimate jubilee for Israel. It's incredible how the Bible continues to point towards this. You know that literally Jerusalem was waiting for this. The Jews were waiting for this. If you're thinking like, how did they not do the math and not know? This. I, I think they did know this. This is why there seemed to be a large number of Jews constantly circling around Jerusalem waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for this to come because they knew the time was supposed to be soon. This is why characters like Simeon and Anna in Luke's account of the gospel, I'll read those to you. Uh, Luke chapter 2, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Luke 2.38 says, And coming up at that very hour, she, Anna, began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Why? Because they could run the numbers just like you and I. They knew something was about to happen. Who were the magi? The wise men. Where did they come from? This isn't in my notes. This is special for you. Where did they come from? The east. Where's Daniel when he's writing this? The east. Daniel is writing this. Literally. What was Daniel a magi. These Easterners just saw the star come up in the sky. How in the world would they know this had anything to do with a Mashiach, a Messiah, a king of Israel, a prince, a ruler? How would they know any of that? Because Daniel wrote it down when he was in Babylon, when he was in Persia. And the guys coming from all over there, they, did, they knew, they saw the star. They didn't just go, that's an interesting star. They came because they could calculate like you and I could calculate. When Jesus even entered into Jerusalem, it said this, as they, were, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed, the crowds of people, they supposed the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. The people were waiting for this. They, they knew something was about to happen. You know, there's a good number of scholars who actually think that Jerusalem was more packed at Jesus' crucifixion and at his resurrection and then subsequent Pentecost, more Jews were there than ever before because they had done the numbers and they knew that that was the time that there was supposed to be this final entering into Jubilee. They were ready for it, which would actually make sense because that's when the, these huge number of Jewish converts to Christianity go out into the world. And it's incredible the way that the Lord has worked all this. I've read a commentator, Matthew Henry. He's from the 1600s. The Reformed commentator wrote a whole bunch about uh, this kind of stuff in the Bible. And as he writes through the book of Daniel, he says this, in an indictment to the Jews, he says this, this prediction should silence the Jews and will condemn them for reckon the 70 weeks from which of the commandments to build Jerusalem we please. He's basically saying, hey, pick any of the starting dates. Reckon them from which of these you please. It is certain that they, the 490 years, have expired above 1,500 years ago so that the Jews are forever without excuse who will not own that the Messiah has come when they have gone so far beyond their utmost reckoning for his coming. He's telling them the calendar speaks against them. They should have known that their Messiah prince was coming. When they watched Jesus Christ heal people, raise them from the dead. When even some came to at night, they go, well, you know, you, you can't be a bad guy. You, you, you got to be of God because how could you be doing these amazing and mighty things? They knew he was the Messiah. But their hearts were so hardened, hypocritical, filled with hatred and greed that they could not, would not receive their Messiah. God had always had a plan and he had been working this plan through his people. 490 years it took for the people to make such an amazing mess of everything that he had to take them into exile. He gave them a second chance, put them back in the land. How do you think they did the second time around? Worse than before. Guys, I, I, I say this in all seriousness. I don't think that there's ever been a worse group of people in history than these Jews. And I, I think that's Jesus' language, not mine. Never were there a more stubborn group of people in history. They were worse than all the other nations. In the Old Testament, the surrounding nations eventually like stepped away and were like, oh, we're, we're not as bad as them. Because that's how wicked the Jewish people were, all the while saying that they were the one true people of God. Time and time again, they rejected the clear and unmistakable miracles of God. 
who had chosen them. And every time they're blessed, they take those blessings and they turn them into idols to worship repeatedly. They even ended up in exile because of it. And God restored them. But they ended up even worse. Jesus even said that all of the righteous blood shed on earth would come upon the Jews of his generation. When Sodom and Gomorrah stand before God in judgment, they could say at least we weren't as bad as the Israelites. And Jesus says they'd be right. He said Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up in judgment against this generation of Jews. No one has sinned more grievously than these people. No one's necks were as stiff and stubborn. No one would refuse God as much as the Jewish people had. They need Jesus, you might think, and that's exactly right. But there are more than any other people group on the planet, we ought to expect the greatest resistance to the gospel from the Jewish people because it's theological. The greatest missionary in the history of the world, the Apostle Paul, almost lost his mind trying to convert Jews. He set out to convert Jews and forget it. Forget you, Jews. (laughs) Go into the Gentiles. In fact, do you remember when Jesus told his disciples to preach the gospel from town to town? And if they meet, the re- if they meet resistance, what were they to do? They were shake the dust off their feet and move on. What people group did that actually happen for? Only one. Only the Jews. They were the only ones who were so stubborn that literally, dust off my feet, I'm done with you. That's literally the way that it went down. And yet, God worked all of this and provided forgiveness for even this wicked people. Consider then the magnitude of the loving kindness of God. You see, I think that Israel, literally, is supposed to be a picture for us of sinfulness, needing forgiveness, not, 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 not any, anything built on merit, or, or, or right thinking, or uh, ability to calculate rightly, or uh, our, our pedigree, a people needing Christ. 490 years, they made a mess, exile because of it. 490 more years, they make an even worse mess. And what's the cost for that? Not one that they will pay. One that an anointed one, a Messiah, a prince will pay. One that he will deal with. He alone is the solution for their sins and for all of our sins. We are all, like the Israelites, lost and without hope, apart from God's forgiveness of our sins. We cannot be, like so many, relying on a few heroic moments to solve our problem. Well, I'm not all bad. Look Look at my life. I've got some good things that I've done in my life. I've got some moments that aren't so terrible. Look, the Jews could do that. They could point back to the moment that David killed Goliath with the stone. They could point back to, ah, remember Elijah standing strong against all the prophets of Baal, and he stood there, and and, and he, he won that battle. You know what? Yeah, but those things are immediately overshadowed by what follows next. David and his son of Bathsheba murdering one of his closest confidants. Elijah and his little one-man pity party he has alone on Mount Sinai because he doesn't think that God's caring well enough for him and his people. Even in our shining moments, if I, were to, if I were to look at any one of those moments, you'd say in your life, like, man, that season of my life, I, 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 things were going really well. Really? If we inspected everything, would you want people to know all the thoughts, all the things, all the... You and I are tainted in our sinfulness. None of us can rely on any of our own good actions to save us. Knowing facts about the Bible isn't the solution. Having, good right, having it written down isn't enough. As Paul would say, the Jews had the oracles of God. And yet they turn their backs on him. Being born into the family is irrelevant. If you're like, well, I'm a Christian. I grew up in Christian churches. My parents are Christian. I had so many people pray over me. I don't even, can't even remember a number. You know, the Pharisees once told Jesus, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, remember? From these very stones, God could raise up descendants of Abraham. Having a special experience, many of them, isn't the solution. You know, sometimes, people, sometimes people in our modern day, they're like, well, I, 
I know the facts about God. I just need, this, I need to feel a special feeling and then I'll be saved. That's what I need. I need, to, I need to get my mind, my heart. I need to get the music right. I need to get the, the mood lighting just right. We need, to, we need to orchestrate our services in such a way so we get a, a feeling. And if the feeling comes, the experience comes, then we know that it's real. Guys, if you think that you can recreate an experience greater than that of a Jewish person standing on the banks of the Red Sea as the sea parts, you're out of your mind. No experience you'll ever have could be like that. No, it's not about just experience. You and I need what the Jews needed here, forgiveness of sins. You see, Daniel was crying out for forgiveness. That's what he said. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive my people for our sins. God says, you can have it. 490 years. Final and ultimate, complete forgiveness will come. It will not come because God says, oh, you're going you're gonna to do great. The second time around, it's going to go awesome. You're, the restored Israel is going to be, you guys, you're finally going to learn your lesson. No, you're going to fail again. And then you're going to fail again. And you're going to fail again. What you need is a perfect Savior to take your sins to the cross. If you're not a believer today, you need to know that's the only possible hope for you. You need to repent of your sins. You need to turn away from all the things that you put your hope in and put your hope in the only thing that's worth putting your hope in. Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to die for the sins of all who ever believe in him. And then he rose from the dead, that you and I may have new life in heaven with him for forever and ever and ever. It's our only hope, belief in Jesus, and none of those other things. If the Lord offers this for Israel, for this wicked people, who time and time and time again continue to do this, he's done it for you. No one is too far lost. That's one of the messages of the Bible. The worst of the worst, our Lord saves because his mercy is so great. What the people needed was not a city, but a savior. And that's what God gave them. Brothers and sisters, we're about to have communion together. This is where we share of a meal that represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And when we do it, not only does it point back to a historical moment, a time in which Jesus actually died for our sins, but to the reality that apart from this, apart from his death, we have no forgiveness of sins. We have no hope but to try to be better than the Israelites. No, we can have eternal life with him only because all the punishment due for our sins was laid upon him on the cross so that we can have forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we love you and your word. We love Jesus Christ and his coming to this earth, the Messiah, Prince, the ruling anointed one who is worthy of all worship, perfect, just and righteous, forgiving and merciful. Father, I pray that we would lean into that and we would believe it. I pray that we would share it boldly with others. I pray that those who are not believers today would hear this word and cry out to you for salvation. It's their only, only hope, Lord. They need forgiveness of sins. And you, O oh Lord, a perfect forgiving God, provides that for us in your Son. And not through any other way, Lord. I pray that as we partake of these elements this morning that we'd be able to drink it in and think deeply about what it means. And we don't have to hang on a cross. We don't have to go to hell, be separated from you for forever because of our sins, because... The penalty for those sins has been paid for in your perfect son. And we thank you for those things in Jesus' good name. Amen.